Hi everybody, welcome to episode 75 of the Winter Hills podcast, sponsored by Chia Charge. If you want to fuel your adventure with real food made with real ingredients, then head over to www.chiacharge.co.uk. How are you doing, Edwina? Gary's just asked me if I'm, what did you say? Are you focused or are you focused. concentrating? You're focused, Eddie, come on, come on. <laughs> it, I think guess working with me is, is a bit like you being the maths teacher that I had at school that would be like, if you just concentrated a little <laughs> bit, you could do so much better. <laughs> oh, honestly, let's just chat. I must try harder. I used to get that quite a few times. Yeah. Do you know once at school I got the maths prize, Ooh. but it wasn't the maths prize, it was for effort in maths. Uh, oh, my sister's ripped it out of me. I didn't I think just, they started doing all that kind of stuff for a few years later, wasn't it? Everyone got a medal at sports day and all that. Oh, thing. yeah. No, it was, it was. I did try, you know. I was a trier. And now when my oldest comes back from college and, and the French do their maths differently and yeah. he's doing long division at the moment and he, oh. I'm like... I can't, I can't help you. I can't even remember how to do it in English. And because he doesn't, if he's doing maths, he'll do it with the French numbers as well. He wouldn't, he speaks French as he's doing it. It's just, yeah. I'm like, just wait for dad. Just wait. We have to just get Esme downstairs. If George is um, doing some homework and we're a bit stuck, we call Esme down. <laughs> you see, this is going to be it. As I work through the children, once they get past about six, then I have to move on to the next yeah. child to go help with the help with the homework help with the homework but i think as you go through the kids as well they get more and more self-sufficient with the homework because you're yeah. really diligent with the first one and then they just sort of like get it done and then that the poor i mean eve's just like sits eve just sits and does a reading while i'm like cooking or whatever and then i go oh you've done it and she's like yeah mum, i've just read you the whole book Oh. Oh. Anyway, we've digressed. We've digressed. <laughs> See, no focus, no focus. You were right, Gary. No focus. Anyway, you're right. What's up? Or oh, shall I talk about me first? Yeah, you go Let's first. Talk me. Me. Let's talk about me first. Um, we've just had a fresh, white, fluffy layer of snow last night. Wonderful. We haven't had any snow for many weeks. So though we still had loads of snow because it's been freezing, we haven't had any fresh snow. They were definitely getting bits of the piste as you were skiing. It would say, Nerj Monk, no, no, missing snow. Be careful, batches of mud. So um, uh, we are now got some nice fresh snow, but unfortunately I've got an ill child. So I'm just looking at the snow out of the window and saying one day you will be mine. But I had a good week last week. I did my first 2000 meters climbing on my skis, which I like to be able to do. That's like my, that's about, that's about all I could do. If I drop the kids at school, come home, sort my skis out walk the dogs or whatever, tidy up, drive down to the uh, car park. And yep. if I ski until what I call the bell rings, until I then have to go and get them <laughs> and I can fit in about 2,000 metres. Um, I've noticed your Strava's evolved into winter Strava. Is it winter? Yeah, exactly. If I if I drove somewhere else where there wasn't quite where we live, like I get to the top of every hill, so then I have to take my skins off my skis, put yeah. coat on, change my boots, ski back down again. So that takes every well, it depends how much chatting. If I'm with mates, it's quite a lot of chatting in that point as well. <laughs> um, but if I'm on my own, I do it a little bit quicker. But it takes like between five and ten minutes, and then so that all adds up to the overall time. And if you've got to do that like six times, it's basically an hour wasted. Yeah, yeah. Very Whereas like, if I drove somewhere a bit further, I could do more up with less of the transitions. But then that means, anyway, it's complicated. But anyway, I got 2,000 meters, felt good, did the last up. The last up of those um, 2,000 meters are always the hardest one when your legs are really tired um and you don't really want to go up anymore but they're always the ones that count they're the ones that count yeah, when it gets yeah. to like the 70 80 miles the 10 hours in when you're feeling really tired you're like I know this feeling it felt good to put myself in that bit of pain again um I totally overdid it I think we recorded the podcast and I did a massive hill session last week. Then I went and did plyometrics. Then I did weights. Then I did my recovery and I oh died. Goodness. I died in the 
ass. I didn't drink enough electrolytes. I got a yeah. massive headache, as you know, Gary. Um, and uh, I overdid it. So I've re precision hydration, reordered a massive, spent half my salary, monthly salary, and reordered uh, a massive flake. You've got to keep those electrolytes going in when you do we're at altitude these long sessions and also when i'm skiing i tend to not drink as much i think because um i just i just get i think i just get really dehydrated from being out that long at the altitude yeah. maybe you don't feel as thirsty anyway i've made a concerted effort to make sure i've got electrolyte in my bottles every day but feeling good i'm feeling a little bit lost as to what i'm going to do now with no utmb oh yeah they don't seem to have been listening to the podcast and heard my rage and offered me a play if we invite them on the show <laughs> shall we that. invite the race director on the show I think it's a woman, isn't it? She's pretty. She's sold They're out, a family it? affair, aren't they? I think family yeah, family. I think they've sold it now, though. So surely someone else is doing it. I don't know. You're just anyway, I got more and more rage, Gary. The the underlying rage from last week only heightened. I you were uh, one of my clients was quite funny, and he called the running stones the money stones. Um, and I was like, I don't want to go and do any of their other. I don't want to go and jump through hoops to to get to get back in the lottery to then might not get a place again. I don't want to do any of those races. They all cost money. They, yeah. they mean going places. They mean accommodation. They mean organizing time away from the kids. It's like it's become why I stepped away from triathlon was because. It, I felt it was a bit of a money-making middle-aged white men's sport becoming, you know, the more money yeah, you could put on it. And I feel like I don't pay. That's not what trail running to me should be. That if you've got the money, it becomes very... Um, you narrow inclusive. the window of opportunity, don't you? There's, don't yeah. you? If you haven't got the money, if you haven't got the time to constantly go and jump through all these hoops and you can't do the race, well then, okay. There's heaps of other races. There's heaps of other races that cost half as much around here, which would be a lot more pleasant, a lot less people. Um, it won't get a bat on up the in the eye yeah. because uh, there'll be, you know, a third of the people. So anyway, I just feel that um, we should be encouraging people. We should be encouraging and looking at ways to allow people to do these races, not the way slowly closing all the doors. So it just becomes people with money and time that can do these races. I will not talk about this again. Rant over. No, no, no. Take it. It's good. It's valid. <laughs> I'm not interested. In it. It's not. It's you know. I I really a few years ago now. Imagine if they my... did that for Lakeland Hundred, and they were like, "You can only enter our race if you go and do these other subsidiary races, and yeah. then you might not get in, and they're going to be like double the price of what they used to be." Yeah. I I wish people would be more like, "Why are we accepting this?" I don't have any energy for race entry admin um if it's if it's easier like late 100 was relatively easy you just did a ballot um you had a big window to enter the ballot <clears throat> if you got in you got in <clears throat> yeah other races where you need to do like say these entry race criteria or maybe set your alarm for some silly o'clock in the morning to uh you know beat everybody else to the keyboard and I th things like that you know i think it's really unfortunate if you i'm lucky i'm quite flexible in my work but if you have a job where maybe you're traveling or you just can't make it to a keyboard when the entry system opens it's like you miss out every time and um yeah if i have to think about it too much i won't enter the race it's simple as that this <laughs> is too much for you gary <laughs> anyway enough ranting what uh what what have you been doing more 200 jeez louise <laughs> yeah we've got another session today um on my own though today unfortunately so we'll see if i do that but pretty good week i think um <laughs> Well, we got we've had crazy winds again in the UK. Um, Storm Malik, I think it was. Lots of trees down, fences down. I look at my, every time the, I hear the wind outside. I'm looking at my fence. Thinking, Don't want that fence to go again. No, Don't it's literally that. cost me a blooming arm and a leg. I can't afford another one. <laughs> so far, it's still up there. Um, but yeah, 80 miles for the week, so I can't grumble with that. I only managed the Zwift once, um, and that was a quite a hard session actually. It was three times sorry six times by five minutes and um i watched a bit of netflix when i was doing that my goodness it was super hard i watched I um do if i'm doing a session i had my chair charge bars to the right of me just to keep me um because i noticed with cycling my, my energy all of a sudden more than running 
energy just disappears like that and i really need to grab something quite quick um so yeah we had those at the ready uh and then this oh what's it called we're all dead this um nice new show on netflix yeah 100 not family viewing so don't sit down there <laughs> with your bowl of nachos and guacamole not Eddie viewing <laughs> Yeah, I watched a few people's faces being eaten off on this. Uh... <laughs> yeah, talk about that sort of thing. Yeah, how's that sort of thing in the front? Classic zombie stuff, really fun. You know, if you. What while you're cycling? Yeah, watched uh, Smash two, two of those, two episodes of that. It was great. But it was good because it was subtitled. So I could read it and um, because I couldn't. Oh, I couldn't how can you do that and do your training session? I couldn't oh, do that. It's awesome. It's clearly it's not working cool. hard enough. That's what I said. <laughs> Probably not. Well, the puddle of sweat would disagree with you on the floor. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I did my two medium long runs. So that was good. Uh, and then what else did I do? All oh, my strength and conditioning. So only one speed session. I normally had to do two, but then I did two medium long runs and I did my. Um, uh, a session on the bike so the session on the bike did kind of swap out for the other speed session that i would have done i like the way you're incorporating this you haven't added it as an extra you sort of like yeah. embraced it into the plan which i i yeah. really like well done gary yeah, it's working well so i think i can't grumble with that i'm just still making poor food choices um and that when is you say a poor food choice poor poor poor, poor. <laughs> You know, there's a well, poor food choice. Well, I just, you know, I, I tried to do this no junk um, on a school No night. junk, not drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but then I look in the fridge and there's like Rice Krispie cakes and stuff. And it's like, well, just one of those. And then one turns into... Well, why, what, do you not do it like what I do the kids? I'm like, fruit, eat your fruit. If you're hungry, you want your snack, eat your fruit. And then you get your... And it gets well, I out. just the, the thing is, once I've opened the door to the sugar, Friday was classic. We, um, which I could eat sweets on a Friday, but that's why I went berserk on Christmas chocolate because I just had one chunk, and then before I knew it, I had like a sugar headache from all the junk I'd, I'd eaten. Um, so you get your head sugar headaches, I get my electrolyte missing <laughs> headaches. <You get laughs> I felt really sugar. poorly, so I'm like, I can't. Oh, no. stop eating that. Yeah, you know, I have that. yogurt. I have like this really nice protein yogurt in the fridge. I know you, you, you and Bryn have the same face when I go, why don't you have some yogurt? <laughs> uh, oh, what? And if I'm hungry, I'll eat that and I'll put some fruit on it and some, no. I like chocolate, no. cheese on toast, those kind of things. Big bowls of cereal. That's my... It's good. And your, your body's hungry. If you look going in the fridge, it's hungry. Just feed it, man. Just don't yeah. overthink it. I shouldn't stress. But yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying my best. No junk on a school night. And more, you know, I always think with these things, you're never going to nail it 100% of the time. Um, so if I can do it like 75% of the time, then that's better. And, I put uh, so little thought into what I eat that it's quite... I mean, I literally just... Bryn does the cooking in the evening and I do the bedtime. I come down, he hands me a plate of food. <laughs> and he, he he does spend quite a lot of time like cooking these really nice veggie curries and stuff. And yeah. like last night, I, I literally ate it and he was like, did you like that? <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, uh, what was it? I literally inhaled just this big <laughs> plate of food. I think that says a lot about my current uh, fatigue state as well. Race results. This week, we had the Arc of Attrition down in Cornwall. Uh, they did an awesome live feed, which I popped in and out of to see people. Uh, I had a voice note from James Elson of Centurion Running, who ran it. Um, huge kudos to him. He had a up and down day. I think there was a bit more down than up, but he pulled himself out of a pit and went on for a 26 hour finish. But he said the conditions were smoking fast, the best yeah. they've ever been. And he's done it twice. And he's been down there quite a lot on the course. He knows the course really well. And he said they were the best conditions he's ever run it they were so good that for the last 25 miles um the guy that won the 50 put on carbon road shoes and ran on the coastal path what how good <laughs> i mean um so we've got mark derbyshire oh my gosh 19 hours 12 minutes 48 seconds he also last year smashed lake 100 didn't he we can't find him anywhere he's, he's completely off grid he's <laughs> off the grid probably pops yeah. up with these races and smashes it but i think when i did lake 100 i've said this a few times i was broken 
because I, and then I knew exactly. I'm a bit. I've got lot, lots of um, not anxiety, but I'm worried about this year's Leighton Hundred because I know exactly what's in store. Every it feels like every month marks out there, and not just completing, crushing hundred milers. Um, so fast, amazing, amazing, so resilient. fast. And then Nikki Spinks, fifty-one, fifty-two. Nikki Spinks. Yeah. Yeah. The rest of the women's field showed them how it's done. Nikki's hair is crazier than mine. I didn't know that there was a uh, there was someone else in the hood, but she has got bigger hair than I've got. Uh, and she masterclass in ultra running, twenty five hours, thirty five minutes, fifty two. I wonder if she wrecked it because obviously it's not local to her. Uh, I wonder if she went down there or she just. I, I've got no idea what the course is like. Is it quite easy to follow nav wise? Well, it's the middle of the night, a lot of it. So mm, whatever great. course you're on is quite hard. It's a coastal path. So, but I know it's hard. I know there's bits that you can easily go wrong and you can end up going around in circles. Um, and then if you add in the bad weather as well, but I think they were very lucky with the weather this week, though it was quite cold apparently. So if you weren't moving that fast and you were suffering a bit, you can imagine that cold wind. Um, so well done to the to both everybody that did both the 100 and 50 miles. And some people that weren't so lucky with the weather, the, the runners on the Lady and Way 100. I know from the northeast, the wind was horrendous over the weekend. And I had a friend out there, uh, Adam Bridges, who completed it, did really well. And yet, yeah, we battered and battered and battered with wind uh, for hours and hours and hours. So, yeah, well done, everyone who got out and toured the line for that one. How do you pronounce that one, Eddie? Sam. It's tire, but with an R on the end. <laughs> I just wanted to hear you <laughs> try. Tyra. Anyway. Tyra. Would you go Tyra? Sam Tyra. Tyra. Yeah, we'll go with that. Sam Tyra. Well done. 18 hours, 45 minutes and 58 seconds. So my goodness, you know, Dark Mark Derbyshire uh, smashed it. Sam had horrendous weather. I'm really curious on the terrain for this uh, Lady Anne's Way. I've yeah. got some intel yeah. from Adam on Thursday, Thursday, if he's out. Apparently he's on crutches. I don't know what's happened there. No. But, um, inflammation, I think. And then Emma Stewart, 1939, 19 hours, 39 minutes and 21 minutes. Wow, too rapid, rapid times Really good there. times. Yeah, really, really good times. Really good. Well done. This week we talked to Shane Benzi. It was great. You know, I really enjoyed it, Eddie. I think I talked about this um, when we had Brody Sharp on the show and he's coming on again soon. Just talking to people who have knowledge and want to share it and they are really good at sharing that knowledge too. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I really enjoy talking to people like that. His book kept me great company as I was doing the research for the podcast. Um, yeah, it was really, I really enjoyed it on my long runs and I hope you all enjoy this interview with Shane Benzi. delighted to welcome onto the podcast this week Shane Benzie. I have actually been to one of Shane's talks before but Ooh. he won't remember well obviously he's not gonna remember me I was in the audience but I was it was at um I think it was either at Druid's Way or Pilgrim's Challenge one of them I reckon I can't remember I was a bit broken and I sort of lay there on the side against the wall as you talked about posture and excellent running and I was like a wreck going oh god I'm terrible anyway welcome to the podcast how are you where are you and have you been for a run today well thank you very much for inviting me it's great to be on <laughs> I'm at home just got back in and I haven't run but I've watched about 15 people <laughs> running. <laughs> been sort of stroking my chin wistfully and uh, giving out uh, in good information. So I have a run by proxy. <laughs> Are you? Do you still run? I know you've got injury in your past, yeah? Yeah, no, I do. I don't, I don't uh, race anymore, um, but I run. Uh, so yesterday morning, it was a beautiful morning yesterday morning. So I was up early before coaching and went out and for about an hour. So yeah, I still run for fun and, and I, I travel a lot. So whenever I'm traveling, I run. So yeah, it's still a big, big part of my life. Actually, the injury that the, my famous left knee, actually, once I'd learned to run and move better, actually, <laughs> kind of not so much of a problem anymore. So yeah. don't, <laughs> don't we all have a famous left knee? My I think is always the one if something's going to chirp up it's going to be that dodgy knee or dodgy back 
it's, it, it's interesting actually because for most of us nearly all of us our, our left leg is our stabilizing leg and that's often why it's the left knee that gets it because we use that leg to stabilize and often push off more than we do the right so it's often why it takes more of a beating oh, he's, he's awesome. earned his cheer charge bar already gary he's given yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> I, I know it's actually if I'm doing an easier trail running and I'm I'm climbing up a uh, steep ascent, I've got to be quite mindful to swap the leading leg. Otherwise, I could end up with an enormous quad <laughs> on on one side of the body. It's uh, yeah, it is quite. I find focused. it worse going downhill because you always want to yeah. lead with that breaking leg, and then I'm yeah. like, oh, I got to check, yeah. but I don't like it so much. It's the same skiing. I like that turn. Oh, you don't like that one so much. <laughs> anyway, we've digressed. You go, Gary. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I'd love if you could uh, tell us about Running Reborn and how you found yourself doing what you do today. It's quite a journey um, from studying sharks to, I suppose, studying and helping people with their running form. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, so I was a runner and, and kind of still am, but back in the day, my running was uh, kind of, I think the, the fun of it was eroded to a degree by two big things, and I think a lot of people will identify with this. I kept getting injured, um, and I seemed to just wander from one injury to a niggle to another injury, and the other thing was, I just wasn't getting any better. You know, I was trying really hard, trying to get fit, buying all the gear and doing everything I possibly could, but was constantly getting injured and just wasn't getting any better at it. So um, I kind of persisted for a while. And then in the end, I sort of ticked just about every single box I could and then started to think, well, maybe it's actually the way I'm running. Maybe I'm yeah. just not in a, in a very good way. So I kind of went on my own journey at first, really, to try and find a, a, a better way to run. Um, and actually got really excited with it all and ended up it's ended up being everything that I do but that that's kind of that's where the journey started by just trying to get better myself you said about purchasing different things what is the bit of tech that you think you bought in the past that you think oh my goodness me if I'd never have listen I bought it all but I think <laughs> I think the big thing that there was uh I, I was doing a the race called the Grand Union Canal I don't know if you know oh that, wow right? yeah yeah Oh, it's, on Gary's, it's on Gary's bucket list. Okay, excellent. Okay. I kind of had, uh, I, very early on in my running career, I, I kind of took on that race, probably long before I probably should have. Um, and I did DNF it with my with my dodgy left knee. Um, and that was okay because I'd kind of probably jumped ahead really on what I was able to do. And it was a big learning curve. And I thought, right, I'm going to come back next year and I'm going to do that race and I'm going to beat it. And so I got super fit and bought all the gear and tried to tick all the boxes I possibly could. And I actually DNF the race again the next year, even though I was as fitter than I'd ever been. Um, I got to about 100 miles and my, and, my, and my left knee kind of went again. So, so I really did go out, start buying everything I possibly could. And probably the, the, the craziest thing I bought, or it seemed crazy, it seemed okay at the time, but looking back seemed a bit silly, was I bought a pair of socks. Um, that were, and then they were about £25 at the time, which was... I remember these. <laughs> oh, really? And the uh. socks woven with silver linings so, to make me supposedly more bound and, uh, and I bought these socks thinking right this could be it you know my knees probably won't hurt if I'm just more bouncy and yeah. these socks didn't make me more bouncy well clearly they didn't and uh, that was probably it was at that point I probably thought right maybe I should do something else <laughs> look, look a bit look a bit harder what about yourself Eddie any uh little any dodgy purchases dodgy purchases I don't think so. I've never really bought into the uh, into the um, into that sort of market. I'm quite a country girl. I like things simple. <laughs> Trainers. Uh, I probably did it my triathlon days. I probably spent far too much money on a oh, car. Oh wow! Bike. Yeah, definitely yeah. triathlon. When my husband went the bike or the car, that's that's the sort of money we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> So Shane, you you were just telling us earlier that you've worked with fifteen people today. Can you tell us what a sort of typical day looks looks like for you, and sort of common reasons why people contact you and go, Shane, help? <laughs> I presume that's what they do say when uh, they're... that's pretty much it, actually. Yeah, sometimes it's sometimes it's a call, but that's basically the message. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm so I, well, I guess actually my work is is kind of split between uh, being a, a coach, a, a running coach and analyst. So I do a lot of movement analysis and coaching um, and I'm also a researcher as well. So I probably spend probably half my time in the year researching and then half of my time coaching. So all of the coaching that I'm delivering is essentially based really on, on, on the research that I do. 
Um, because when I went, when I started my journey to find a better way to run, actually it was really confused. I found it really confusing. Everything was based on a treadmill, uh, uh, which didn't kind of make sense to me. And everything was also explained by kind of biomechanics, which seemed to kind of confuse me more than um, enlighten me as to how to move. So I, I, I kind of, when I really decided this is what I want to do, I want to be a coach. I was really keen to, to try and do as much of my own research as I possibly could so that the, 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 you know, the coaching I would be done would be on the back of that. So if it's a coaching day, then I coach from uh, the uh, <clears throat> boring like most people come to me um and uh, all the work i do is outside so i have people running around do lots of video analysis of them put very clever sensors on them as well so we can look at some interesting data i like a little bit of data um and then lots of and then lots of coaching uh, based on the the information from the kind of uh, video and the data um and then sort of send them off with with kind of lots of uh, homework and practice people have to is it like a you you know they you send them away and then you say come back again in like six weeks let's see how let's have yeah. some more face face time is that the sort of way the process works generally yeah in fact it's amazing you say six weeks I don't know how that that's exactly the amount of time that I generally give <laughs> because over the years I've kind of tried a month or two months or but six weeks is around about the time so big thing to, to, to think about with your movement, because that's essentially what I'm looking at is people's movement, not really their fitness. With movement, when you change your movement patterns, it's essentially a software change. Yeah, you are rewriting the software, your brain. The muscles aren't really remember anything. They get strong at the task, but they don't really remember. So it's a software change. And it takes around about six weeks to start to make those software changes and for the changes you've made to start to feel more natural if you like and the soft tissues the hardware if you like that that starts to adapt then to the to the new messages so yeah so very often people will come for multiple sessions and they're generally around about six weeks apart they're normally two hours long so you come along and have some initial video analysis running around outside um, have a look at that video together see what it looks like it's always enlightening and I bet people, uh, i'd be like oh no no <laughs> <laughs> my bum's so big <laughs> you're like that doesn't matter Eddie we're looking at running form and I'm yes like, oh, no. <laughs> once you've identified the size of your bum then we might look at <laughs> falling or what you're God, after. shapes and arrows and then we <laughs> <laughs> And, and then, and then yeah, based on what we see, then we do the work. But actually, it is, it is good fun, though. And I think this is the thing. And, it, you know, a lot of people come and they're actually quite nervous. But, yeah. you know, we're talking about it. And actually, the workshops are good fun. You know, there's some serious messages to get across and some serious work, but they are fun. And the other thing about analysis and coaching is I think it should also be about celebrating what the person does well. Yeah, because if you do something well if you know why you do it well and the fact that it's good in the first place you're a lot more likely to do it even better so it's about celebrating what's good as well as looking what what could be better it's just like kids you tell them what's good and yeah. then you say actually always give the good bit first, absolutely. <laughs> good bit first. <laughs> would you ever find yourself being a like a bit of a backseat driver just bothering people at a park run just to see oh you know you could uh, uh yeah i mean i've been i've been known to be driving along in the land road and actually turn around and follow runners because i kind of want to see what they're doing <laughs> my wife is a short bit i'm really not allowed to do that you shouldn't you shouldn't stalk people <laughs> driving along stalking people so yeah it's a bit of an occupational hazard to be honest with you when you <laughs> can't help watching and see what they what they do Excellent. <laughs> I've really enjoyed um, refreshing myself with your book, The Lost Art of Running. It's a really, well, it's a, I didn't read it. I listened to it. It was an audio book as I was doing my daily commutes. Um, yeah, what can people expect from the book? I, I, It was funny, maybe not a good audio book. I was running along and when I listened to the bit on cadence and um, I think you mentioned every time you breathe in and out, it's every three uh, steps. Well, I was I was doing two, and you did as a caveat to say, kind of build up to this. It's not like um, easy to do initially, but yeah, when I tried to do the three, I was on the verge of hyper hyperventilating. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, what could people expect from the book? Yeah, so the book is um, really, I guess, about the um, the journey so far. So, you know, where, where I, what I've learned, 
um, and where I went to learn that and, and who I've worked with to learn that as well. And then there's so there's very much the story of the journey. You know, I've been very, very privileged to travel all around the world, looking at uh, athletes all around the world. But I also spend a lot of time with tribes and indigenous people as well, looking at natural movement for people who don't run at all, because, you know, running is a movement skill. So if you can understand human movement, you, you know, a lot better to, to, to be able to, to coach running movement. So it kind of tracks those journeys. And um, a lot of the runners, I've been lucky to work with some amazing runners who, of course, I'm coaching, but I'm also learning from as well. So, you know, there's hopefully some really good wisdom to come back from those those runners that are in the book and, um, you know, from a, a lot of the trail runners and ultra runners. Um, and and uh, a lot of your listeners will, will recognize a lot of the names that, yeah. are, that are people like Damien Hall, Tom Evans, Beth Pascal, Pavel Polonsi, Nikki Spinks. Right. You know, these are some great runners that I've been lucky enough to work with. Um, and and kind of learn from and then there's also the, the practical element in there as well so once we've kind of followed that journey and understood you know all of the things that i've seen and start to piece together there's some there's a practical element to it where you can actually go out and, and try it and practice it as well so kind of both elements really i've got to ask what is fascia most runners it'll be is a plantar fasciitis is the um kind from of the big... takeaway mostly. yeah <laughs> fascia and the... yeah. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, so plantar fasciitis, yeah, I mean, so your plantar fascia is, is fascia, and that's a beautiful piece of elastic that kind of runs along the, the bottom of the foot, essentially. So if you load your foot well, that fascia that is going to, you're going to load that fascia, and that's going to create spring for you. So yeah. fascia, essentially, essentially for, for, for what we need to know about it, it's a kind of an elastic connective tissue that runs continuously throughout our body. Our tendons and ligaments are part of the, the fascial family, if you like. Um, and then we have something called myofascia, which coats all of our muscles and basically runs through our body. It's basically the binding agent for our body. Yeah. If you, and then this is where, you know, when I'm working with an athlete and working with a runner, and it could be an elite athlete or a complete beginner, it really doesn't matter. It's the same. Uh, you're, one of the big things you're working with on the runner is their perception of their movement. OK, so when you go for a run tomorrow, your run, the way you move is based heavily on your perception of that movement. Yes. And, and I think, you know, we grow up uh, uh, sort of having our movement described to us by traditional biomechanics. And, you know, every time we see the skeleton, it's this kind of upright structure. And I think we sort of see ourselves as a, as a structure that moves in a series with a series of levers. But actually, if you look at the skeleton, actually the skeleton is just 206 bones that are basically floating in a sea of tension created by our tendons and our ligaments yes. and our muscles. So when we move, we're not this heavy, clunky thing that we would want to avoid impact with. Actually, we're this synergistic, connected, fluid, elastic animal whose skeleton is just free-flowing in this sea yes. of elastic. It's amazing. And that's what fascia is. It's creating that sea of elasticity. And what's really exciting about it is, is that it's constantly rejuvenating and revolving and, and, and re-architecting itself. So if you go out for a run tomorrow and you change your movement positions and you challenge this fascia, it will come back stronger, allowing you to make that movement better. So, and that happens until we go to the great running track in the sky. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not just for the young. We're always remodeling our body. And actually our bones and muscles are constantly too. That's really exciting because you can actually take ownership of it and do something with it. And I'm, I'm right in thinking it, it'll rejuvenate every seven months, is that correct? So, so if you were about 25 years old, I don't know if you are 25 years old, I'm not, I wouldn't want to... You wanna... can take a guess if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Could be 23, 26, it's hard to know. Oh, hard to know. You can come in every week, Shane, that's fantastic. <laughs> A little bit past that. <laughs> Another day, <laughs> George Fox. Yeah. If you're in your, if you're in your mid twenties, then a, over a seven month period, it completely ju rejuvenates within oh. seven months. As we get older, that process slows down. You know that that's a, that's a fact of life. But it never stops. Never ever stops. And I think runners, you know, get to a certain age where they think, well, you know, I'm getting on a bit now, and I'm this is all the just damage limitation. I'm flogging the death out of an old body. You know, I need to take it easy. We're really not. You yeah. know, every day you challenge your body by being weight bearing and going through movements, and it rearchitects itself based on that. So if you go out and change your movement and run beautifully, 
your body's going to adapt to that movement through bone remodeling, fascial rejuvenation, muscles re-architecting. Mm -hmm. So it's that Darwinian fitness I talk about, fitness for the body to perform the task. You do the task well, the body adapts to doing that task well. And I think that's really exciting. It's great. It's never too late then, is it? It yeah. literally never is. It's a cliche, but it really isn't too late at all. Absolutely. So. Cool. Um, this is a, off the grid a bit, but um, have you seen a big change in people's fascia and the way that they move since we've um, been suffering with the COVID, COVID pandemic? Have you seen people's running styles? You know, I, I wonder like how much stress and um, and of being not had their normal movement has affected people's running, or maybe you haven't quite seen that yet coming through. Well, so anecdotes, yeah. I mean, so one of the big things for a lot of people is they've they've left their workplace and gone home to, to work from home. Now they might have had a really nice desk at work, and they might even have had a standing desk, which, are, as you know, I think everybody should have. Um, so they may have gone from a standing desk or or or, or a good desk and a good chair work and now be sitting at the kitchen table or underneath the stairs or wherever it is they've got to work and so a lot of people's posture has been compromised and they're sitting maybe more than they would have done when they were at work and so sitting really damages that that sea of tension because if you think about it if your skeleton is 206 bones floating in a sea of tension and we spend nine hours a day cr sort of crumbled over that sea of tension is what you're going to run with you know you only ever run based on how you've spent your day you don't spend your day based on how you ran last night you know you know this static posture creates the sea of tension for your running posture so i definitely see that and you're definitely right uh, stress is a big issue you know if you looked at 100 photographs of people you could pretty much sort of um, guess their emotion from their posture in the photograph you know and if we're sad and if we're not happy then we tend to be we tend mm -hmm. to fall in and if we are happier then we tend to be high you know taller in our movements and actually humans deal with stress and trauma by closing in because we want to close in and protect our vital organs so there are lots of different types of things that cause stress but it does tend to make us close in on ourselves so that definitely has an effect and actually what's a really interesting one as well is uh you know you just watch you go to a supermarket or anywhere and you'll see people wandering around looking at their phones and their head is down looking oh, at so awful. Oh, so awful, isn't it? <laughs> but actually if you've got a mask on you can't you you lose some of that vision so you've actually really got to get yeah. your head <laughs> i hadn't even thought like, of that yeah it, honestly this is how sad i am i really need to get i need to get no, out i love I it want, and so <laughs> People aren't reacting by holding their phones up more in front of their face so that the mask doesn't get in the way. They're actually craning their heads over even more so that they can see over the mask. If you read the book, it's not good leaning your head forward. It, uh, was it multiplies your head weight by whatever it is? Well, yeah, quadruples in weight, but so yeah. up to four times. And and actually, it's, it's so it's uh, in physics, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's called moments. It's, it's essentially it, the actual weight is actually transferred down to the neck and the, and the upper back and the upper spine. But yeah, that head coming for every inch forward it comes, it weighs another ten pounds yeah. and can weigh forty-two pounds if it's three inches down. And if you're looking at your phone, it definitely is without. Yeah, yeah that's a that's quite that's quite scary in a way. And actually, and so you're far more likely to run with your head down posture if if you're spending most of your day with it down. And actually, your inner ear, your vestibular area, that's where a lot of your balance and spatial awareness comes from. Well, if your head is down too much then you lose that balance and spatial awareness as well because a human is designed to be stood upright this head upright looking around for food and not being food so yeah. that we're still that animal we can go to tesco's and get a sandwich anytime we like but actually we are still that <laughs> I, I, it's fundamental we just had russell bentley as i mentioned uh earlier on the podcast who is a big fan of kenyan running and spent quite a lot of time in kenya and has now brought back some of those thoughts and he set up his own uh running coaching business and working to improve people's running form and I imagine is along the same lines of you, of you. and he talks a lot about getting uh, people to imitate um, other runners. Yeah, mimicry, so, wasn't it? Mimicry, yeah, the art of mimicry. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about maybe your learnings from watching the Kenyans, working with the Kenyans and whether you're on that sort of line of mimicry and um, he talked about watching yourself run on the run in a mirror as well but now you've said actually already that you didn't like the treadmill running yeah i'm not yeah I, I, listen treadmills aren't the devil um and if it's the difference between running and not running then you should definitely run on one but i would never analyze or coach anyone on one because that you move kinetically very differently yeah. 
on kind of terra firma. But, you know, he's absolutely right about the mimicry thing. You know, humans are mimickers, without a doubt. And um, in uh, in Iten, where I work, um, the, the, the track there, you'll see the runners and they, they, they run around in eights generally. OK, and, uh, you know, you haven't got to stay there long before you can get these amazing shots of these people running in beautiful symmetry together. Everything is beautiful. But very often when they when, when they in the early days, when the people join the camp, you'll see them running at the back and they don't move like the runners. That run OK, at the so it's not a totally natural thing to Kenyans. Not, not at all. I mean, you know, what we see is the tip of the iceberg when we see the Kenyans running and yeah. they do but you know that's how elite kenyan athletes run okay general generally kenyans or ethiopians you know if they're if they're new to the training camps they may have they'll have maybe done well in a race sort of out in a rural area and will have got a, a place uh in a training camp with in in its end with the with the big boys and the big girls um but they don't move like that but so but they don't get coached to do it what they do is drop into the eight so they'll set off at the back, but what they actually do is they drop into the eight. So now suddenly they're surrounded by beautiful movement. And so through osmosis, through flow, through the power of the group, they change their movement. Um, and that's a fantastic way to learn because it, it really sticks. So nobody really coaches them really what to do with their arms or their footfall or their head position or their cadence. They lock into the group and then run with the group. And, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to spend time with Ronex Capruto, Wilson Kipsang, uh, Edward Kipchoge, world record holders. And actually, if you ask them to kind of list from sort of one to ten what's important, what makes them a good runner, they'll put movement near the bottom, which I always find a bit disconcerting because that's kind of my job. And I'm thinking, well, hang on, guys. Good, it, good, it's 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 awkward. <laughs> awkward. <laughs> you just want to rethink that a little bit. <laughs> But actually, they do move beautifully. But the reason they put it near the bottom is they don't know they learnt it because yeah. they learnt the group. No one ever called them over and gave them a technique session. They learnt it by running in the group. Um, and I think that's an amazing way of learning. And what they also do is when they're not on the track, because if you have an eight uh, on the track, then obviously that and it's an elite eight, that eight is going to move pretty quick. And then if you have a not so elite eight, they're not really going to be able to keep up with the, with the fast eight running around the track. But they have this grid system, which is about the size of four football pitches. And what they do is they have these eights and they're all running, but they run in diagonals so that the elite eight are constantly running past the non elite eight and then the middle. eight, And so they're always passing each other. So even the very beginners, the youngsters are constantly running past and alongside elite world record holding runners and that's amazing that's one of the things of the power of the group and i think we could we definitely learn from yeah, that i was going to ask well have you met resistance sure i'm sure you've like tried to encourage um england athletics and people to to, to use this model um for other groups have you have you encountered a bit of resistance to that or it, actually it's it's been amazing over the last 18 months it's been amazing there are a lot more people are now coming and saying actually can you can you talk to us about this and you know what what can we learn so initially yes without a doubt um uh, because we have the, the ways that we do things and the coaching gets handed down and you know and but but that's changing and and um and the same with uh, i did a keynote speech for for british triathlon last year for their conference um and um you know that was really nice to be asked to come and talk about those sort of things because that you know that that might not always have happened so so definitely um organizations are now a lot more open and i am working with a number of organizations now looking at this very thing and even if you think about youngsters if you think about um you know if you go to, it doesn't have to be running if you if you on a saturday morning if you went to um, a football club for youngsters uh, when they're playing they'll often put them into groups of of, of uh, pretty good runners uh, yeah. uh, football that's not quite so good and then the ones that you know are new and could definitely be better but the ones that could definitely be better never really get to rub shoulders with the really good ones so how are they ever going to do that you know and uh so I think we could definitely learn from integrating skill levels um, because the person who isn't necessarily that great 
I might actually be really funny and have a really good character. Um, and, you know, so we can all, we all have, uh, you know, we all have things that we're good at. And I think the power of the group allows us to swap those and, and maybe we all benefit from each other. So I think it's huge. Uh, if, I think if you, if you look at East African runners, there's lots of reasons why they might be good. It could be uh, growing up in poverty. It could be altitude. It, it could be um, diet, genetics, all of these sort of things are important but i would actually cite the power of the group as the biggest one by far by far. Brendan's quite unique like that um you mentioned football like i would never grace a football pitch with say a premier league footballer but with running you know literally if you didn't see amsterdam marathon or something like that you'd be on the start line with um pretty seriously athletes and it's it's all you need even on a training level see on a on a, it should be tonight, I suppose, but on a Thursday evening, I would go to my local runner club in Central Harriers, and the session would be for every ability. People would obviously run at different paces, and some people might do maybe 10 sets instead of eight sets, but um, fundamentally, we're all there, all there together. You, you mentioned about uh, Kipchoge and people like that. Is there anyone you've looked at? Is you think, my goodness me, they're the finished article um, without any help from yourself? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I. Well I think you'd have to go a long way past Kipchoge, actually. Um, my, my, my stuff with him was to understand from him his perception of movement and try and understand from him yeah, what he thinks makes him a good runner because then that will allow me uh, to maybe understand better what to research and, and what to look for. So he is very good. Uh, I think it's safe to say. Um, but I went to um, – I was actually in Vienna for, the, for his sub two. Um, oh, okay. And, yeah, I was there doing a documentary, and um, I, I was there for the whole event, and uh, and I got I have video analysis of every single lap, um, and um, that I can slow down and look at, and uh, just to see where that gate starts to fatigue as he goes through that two hours. There's no, there's, it just doesn't move. I mean, the the guy, his head position, interestingly, is <laughs> lower than it normally is. Yeah. When he normally Too much time on his phone. <laughs> I told him, stop messaging, get training. That was on Instagram, isn't he? <laughs> but he for, for him, uh, the way he was running, I don't know if you watched it on TV or you, you saw yeah. it, he obviously had the guys in front of him um, and, and the laser. And so actually, because they were just in front of him, he had to have his head a little bit lower yeah, than yeah, he that laser so he probably ran it with a double weighted head um so you know um, and, and a lot of people kind of said oh well you know it doesn't count because he was drafted and all of that kind of stuff but to run behind those people who are constantly changing in and out and are running at a different stride pattern to him to be able to do that i think actually I, I, I think it was harder rather than easier having to do that. I, I really do. I, I think it was amazing that he managed to to do that with that essentially chaos in front of him. Um, yeah. Having to have his head down yeah, you know, yeah. lower yeah. than it would normally have been. So um, amazing. But yeah, I think he's. He, you'd have to go a long way p past um, Eluid Kipchoge. I think he's great. What are your thoughts, and as we're talking about the marathon world record, can you guess what I'm going to ask you on the... Uh, on how the carbon shoes have changed people's runnings, running style. What are your thoughts on them? Yeah, I, yeah, I think... Um, one of I think... on the podcast loves them, and one of them is having nothing to do with them. Oh, you can guess, uh, which... well, <laughs> I, you know, I think, for the every, I think for the everyday runner, I think they can be a negative thing because, you know, we, we almost think we can put these amazing trainers on and suddenly we're going to be kind of bouncing around everywhere. So, you know, seven-year-olds believe in magic trainers. Well, I think adults do as well because yeah. we think we can put these trainers on and they're going to do the work for us. Now, they may, you know, I, I think potentially there is some uh, performance advantage there, but are we really going to think about how our foot lands on the ground and how our foot leaves the ground? Are we going to pay a lot of attention to that if we think all we've got to do is pair, put a pair of trainers on that are going to do a lot of the work for us? And a lot of my uh, coaching with runners is based on how the foot leaves the ground. This was well, my thing. It's like surely it takes away that feeling of... Your foot on the ground at all makes the foot work differently. Yeah, I mean, you've got so you've got a quarter of a million nerve endings on the bottom of your foot. OK, and in those quarter of a million nerve endings, you've got extra receptors. They tell you about how hard you hit the ground and what the ground feels like. And then you've got proprioceptors. They give you your spatial awareness uh, and your perceived rate of exertion. So every time your foot hits the ground, those nerve endings are giving you loads of really exciting information. 
telling you about the environment you're running over. You kind of need that information. Um, yeah, so there's no doubt if you get a great big piece of rubber and then put some carbon in that as well, those nerve endings are kind of looking at each other as if to say, I haven't got a clue what is going on out there. I really don't know. Now, I guess you then could say, well, actually, if you're running on tarmac and it's flat and you know you haven't really got to make too many different movements, you can kind of get away with it. And, and, and that's true to a degree. I mean, anything off road, you would really struggle because you have to proprioceps and, you know, you have to adapt. And I think people have attempted to do do that kind of thing with trail, but I don't think that would work so well. So I, here's what I would say. I would say that if you put them on the feet of incredibly hardworking, focused athletes, they will have <laughs> a marginal gain. Gary's just given himself a back slap for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but if, so, so I think if somebody is moving beautifully and they're doing everything right, they're landing well, they're leaving the ground well, and uh, everything is perfect, then they might give you a marginal gain to be able to, you know, to, to, to be that bit better. But if you, but if we're, you know, if, if the people that are listening are tired, ultra runner, runner. yeah, then, I, then I, I, I don't think so. You know, I really don't think so. I think it's a shame because I think it's taking, it's taking our eye off the fact that we, because actually anything that the, the trainers are trying, any trainers that if they're trying to kind of sell us stability pro or, or help us to be more bouncy or to to feel the ground more all they're trying to do is emulate what the foot does naturally mm. so we have got mm. this this interface between us and the ground the foot is an amazing thing so i think we should put our effort into understanding it and learning how to use it and actually when i work with runners and look at how they leave the ground very few of them leave the ground in a way where they would actually utilize that carbon very well anyway that's exactly what I've heard about them. And I've just been working with some 24 hour athletes that are like, should I wear them Shant Shanto? Because the 24 hour world record was broken by Alex uh, Sodoko and, and he was where yeah. he's now sponsored by Nike and he's wearing them, but he's running at a 6.30 minute mile yeah. for a hundred miles. So he's getting out of that carbon exactly what he should be yeah. getting out of that carbon. But I think as soon as you take away that the force of that and the actual using the carbon, you're just running on a big pillow, but then your everything, your foot and all your appropriate reception, as you said, doesn't know what it's doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. so I think you're better for that longer distance of actually feeling, feeling the fatigue. <laughs> There's probably <laughs> quite a lot of other things you could do as opposed to maybe paying 200 pounds for a pair of super shoes that would actually probably improve your marathon time. To be fair, if I was going to land, if I was going to line up on a road marathon against you, Gary, I'd pay whatever just to be. <laughs> I'd pay three hundred. One day, oh, imagine the viewers would get for that one, Eddie. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it's you know it just highlights these um, runner myths and different opinions, mm. and it's quite a minefield. You know, you Google anything to do with running, my goodness me, and uh, lots of different opinions. I was just curious, any of those myths particularly frustrate you, Shane? Um, I wouldn't have to if they say they whether they frustrate me, but they can be they can be throwing us quite a big curveball. I think one of the big ones. Well, there's a couple of big ones that that, that that certainly confused me in the early days. One of them was impact. Yeah. So you know, even you know, everyone's now cringing, thinking, "Oh my god, impact!" You know, we don't. I don't like impact in everything we do. We want to try and do to reduce impact, and and that was one of the big things that confused me when I first started looking at running because everything I'd heard, and everything everyone would tell me that you need to run light. You know, you don't want to you don't want to make any impact with the ground. You, you want to run as light as you can. Well, actually, you know, the, the faster a human runs, the harder it hits the ground. Yeah. And the harder the more elastic energy it creates and, and, and the more it gets propelled forward so so i think that was one of the big urban myths is that impact is is uh, or hitting the ground hard or or, or or trying to to hit it less hard is a good thing to do and so i don't i really don't believe that and i think because we're scared of hitting the ground we move in a way where we shuffle more to i, I guess try and reduce the height so that we don't hit the ground so hard but that actually means we then move with a more muscle-based propulsion yeah. um, and, and a lot harder. So impact, you know, I don't think, you know, impact doesn't injure runners. Mismanagement of impact injures yeah. runners, okay? And because we don't land our foot correctly, we don't land our foot with this tripod landing that creates this dome effect, which dissipates the impact at source. 
we're sucking ourselves down to the ground trying not to create any air and any impact which means there's nowhere to move which means we have to land on a heel on a straight leg which means we don't dissipate the impact correctly yeah. and then the, the impact we were trying to avoid is now hurting us <laughs> so, and i think we we you know if i put, i have very clever sensors that i put on runners uh, you know, that will tell me in newtons how hard we hit the ground and it will tell me in g-forces how much we decelerate into the ground. Yeah. Great runners, the faster runners, create more impact and more deceleration than, than the, the not-so-good runners. Mm -hmm. It's totally intuitive, but it's, but it, but it's the case. Um, and so, you know, the message is we shouldn't be running around trying to slam into the ground to try and create <laughs> some more elastic energy, but we definitely hold back we should allow that foot to hit the ground as hard as it wants to but just make sure it lands in a way where it dissipates that impact but what about the oscillation i, I always thought less oscillation less oscillation would be better i think i've read that maybe garmin give me that um feedback yeah, yeah. from reading your book it gives you an oscillation doesn't it like or garmin. yeah but but, but reading the book no it, you kind of see the opposite really you get more oscillation Oh, I love a bit of oscillation. Honestly, it's amazing. It's a great so, word too. A great word. It's a great word. So, if you so here's the thing then. So if you think about your stride is a curve, yeah, because it kind of is. You leave the ground, you go into the air, and then you land. Yeah. So it's a curve. You do big curves to go fast, and little curves to go slow. Yeah. We little if, curve. <laughs> if you reduce the amount of heights that you get in your air you can only have little curves yeah and so to go faster you just have to have really spin your feet over quickly and just do lots of tiny little curves so let's say you had um uh, an eight centimeter vertical oscillation yep so well, as you run you know your, your oscillation goes up and down eight centimeters well and let's say you're getting a, a 1.3 meter stride left out of an eight centimeter oscillation and that's as much forward trajectory as you can get out of an eight centimeter oscillation is a, is a 1.3 meter stride length if you want to get a 1.4 meter stride length it means you need a little bit more air yeah. to create a slightly bigger curve and, you know and some of these runners are running around with 13 14 centimeter vertical oscillation now Does garmin that have something to do with the recovery of the of the of the non weight bearing limb because you have longer well as it if, if you think so if you think about it so so if your stride is a curve effectively how hard you push off has a big influence on the curve so if you're going faster you want to push off more so if you push off more and make sure that you have a forward trajectory in that curve you just have more air time going forward so all runners all three of us everybody out there listening we all really want to do the same thing we want to minimize our ground contact time and maximize our flight time because whether we're running ultra is very slow or in relative terms slow or whether we're trying to run fast we're always trying to get the, the best stride length that we could possibly get the most efficient stride length but if we don't get any air we can never create a beautiful curve yeah so so air is good but you must be confident that you've got a good forward trajectory within that air that you've created you can't just bounce up and down okay but most people these days or a lot of people these days are able to look at their oscillation and their stride length yep so very quickly you can see how good your curve is because you can measure the height of it yeah. and you can how long you went in it and i don't think you know we shouldn't necessarily let the software tell us whether that's good or not but we can use those headline figures and start to decide what's a good curve and what isn't a good curve for us at any given speed that's and it. any surface because if you're running on concrete you're going to get a bigger curve because you get more spring off of concrete yeah. or track if you're running on grass you get less so you're going to create a smaller curve so the curve is always changing so i don't think we should really be told what's the most what's the perfect curve yeah. but we should use headline figures to get excited about it but you know if you go to a park run and you sit at the end of the park run and just watch everybody come in from first till last and and then measure and then look at their oscillations and then, you know it, it, it's not right you know there's no coincidence that the people that are coming in quick have big oscillations big stride length lots of air and the people that come in at the end don't and also more oscillation better race photographs <laughs> uh, 
conflict absolutely yeah completely if you can get both those he's things, always he's thinking the carbon shoes the race we're doing he's <laughs> such an influencer i gave myself serious reinards in the way across country because i didn't want to put gloves on because it would spoil the <laughs> race for <laughs> <laughs> But what, what I would just say on that oscillation thing is, and because there'll be people listening, and, and I know you have a lot of trail runners following you, it's you know, and it and it, it might sound as if I'm saying, oh yeah, just bounce around, it's really easy. It is yeah. easy, I, I, yeah. And it, and after a while, it gets quite tiring, with, without a doubt. And you wouldn't get as much oscillation if you were if you were running a, a ultra slowly, yeah. you would if you were running a ten k. But it's all it's all relative. And even if you go out and try and be a little bit more bouncy and create a little bit more air, that's going to feel like really hard work. But like anything, you have to train yourself to do that by doing more springy things. The body gets more springy. You know, the Achilles tendon gets stiffer and stiffer and allows you to be springy. So we shouldn't just go outside and expect the angels to come out and start blowing trumpets because we've started kind of being a little bit more springy off the ground. We do have to ease ourselves into that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no doubt. I think that air is air oscillation is good. We just need to utilize it by going forward while we're in it. Oh, Shane, you've already given us tons of stuff to think yeah. about. I bet people are listening to this thinking, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to read this." <laughs> but um, a lot of a lot of people that will be listening to this podcast very busy, families, training, life, work, and might be thinking, you know, I hardly have time to do my training program. Um, uh, as well as do everything else in my life. When I've got my time to go out, and I'm sure you get this all the time, how do I fit this into my running? You know, I don't want to be adding something else into my life. Is there anything that you can give to us, maybe like a tip or something that someone can do very easily on a run that might change just the way that they just think about their movement, perhaps? Because I think a lot of that, especially in ultra running, is just some uh, almost some pointers when we're getting exhausted. I always say to people, you know, you start collapsing, your chest, you know, you're not breathing. So just shoulders yeah. back. Just, just give yourself a little point. Is there anything you say to people sort of, I can't think of the word to describe it. What would you use as like a tip? Uh... Would it be a cue? A cue. Okay. Oh, my God. It's been a long day. <laughs> so much. Can you edit that bit out, Gary, and just say? Oh, staying in. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Why don't you find the word? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So I think a really good cue then is, so in, in, in the book, I call it the, your centre line. Okay. Um, and so this is not a, a line of fascia. This is a, a made up line, but it runs from your belly button up through your abdomen, up through the chest, underneath the chin to the top of the head. Okay. So it's just a, an imaginary line. Mm -hmm. and you're running I want you to imagine that you just open up that line and you put a bow into that line so you open up the chest area and put a bow into that center line that will get your upper body over your center of gravity it actually brings your hips forward which is more likely to give you uh, a neutral pelvis and engage your core and and because you have continuous elastic connective tissue running from your toes all the way to the top of your head if you get nice and tall and open up that bow, you actually put more surface area into that elastic energy. And it keeps that head up eye line on the horizon as well. So that one line can do amazing things. So you just want to visualize it. And I mean, in the book, I talk about giving it a color and giving it a name, because every time you go for a run, you just want to think, mm -hmm. right, I'm just going to ease into my center line now. And I've got that center line to go faster. The center line, you put more, more of a bow into it to go slower. You put less but it's always there and that will keep you really that will that will keep you with good posture i call it the golden thread which is probably slightly different in that i don't know why i call it a golden thread <laughs> i even write that in people's coaching notes pull the golden thread up <laughs> to pull you up you know and i get people to practice that if they're hill sure. running or or harder i'm like if you can't maintain that position of that pull up yep. you need to back off the pace and form over out of breathness well and so if you i always use this i'm always talking about this word called tensegrity okay and and i use this i've got one here children's toy yeah i always use i never go anywhere without this it's always very close let's go cinema he's always there always, everyone needs a prop yeah <laughs> roy her daddy view i need this in mine. <laughs> Well, sadly, it's not emu. You know. <laughs> so, 
it's a child's toy, but it's it is actually a tensegrity model as well as being a child's toy. And the concept of tensegrity or biotensegrity for us as humans is, as I said earlier, those 206 bones that form your skeleton are floating in a sea of tension. So this toy really, I think, tells the story. The wood is your bones floating and the elastic stuff is your tendons and ligaments and myofascia. So when you move, actually, your skeleton just free flows in a sea of tension. And if you get beautifully tall, now you're going to start to move with elastic recoil. If you were to run around with your head down, then there's no elasticity in that at all. Mm -hmm. Muscles would have to do it. So getting beautifully tall and really coming to terms with the fact that your toes are connected to your head, if you get tall, you create elastic energy. If you can get somebody thinking about that, you don't have to nag them to be tall. You really don't. You know, they want to be tall because they want to accentuate what they now know. And it's something you can do when you're not running as well. All the time, you can be like uh, center line, pull up. Standing at your desk would be, uh, you know, and I know I'm always banging on about it, but do you, know, do you know if you were stood at your desk with on tripod feet, a lengthened spine, neutral pelvis with an engaged core, eye line on the computer, breathing into the bottom third of your lungs? I am. I'm doing exactly now. <laughs> I can't move. I can't move, though. <laughs> but you'd be, you'd be training for nine hours because yeah, exactly. you're dynamic. It's training. Free training. Whereas if you're sat with your sea of tension, which is hunched over, you're detraining. So, and don't, you know, if you get one, don't chuck away your chair because it can be quite very tiring at first. But even if you were weight bearing for some of the day, because for a lot of people now they're working from home. You know, you could go a week without being weight bearing. You wake yeah. up in the morning, you, you've just been asleep for eight hours. You come downstairs, have some breakfast, sit in front of the computer, do that all day, watch a movie in the evening, go to bed, and you could go all the way through the week without really being weight bearing. So, um, if you can spend some of your time just standing with even weight on your hips, you are strengthening your body. You really Actually, are. Actually, every successful runner we've talked to on the podcast, apart from Beth Pascal, she wasn't a, a standing up desk, but then she was she was traveling, wasn't she? But majority of them are standing up when we talk to them, aren't they? It's the yeah. burnout desk city. <laughs> I'm at a standing up desk now, but I am sitting down, but I have been on my skis for five hours so that I feel that's okay. I think that a little bit of leg rest is quite good. And then I've got to do bedtime for three kids. So I'm allowed. Like, well, yeah. Go from extremely that's sedate to extremely active. There's no... <laughs> <laughs> There's no, that's me, Gary. Gear one and gear five. There's nothing in between. You have started to get taller throughout the hour, though, so that's good. I think because you've been talking to me, I'm like, oh, Shane's going to go. Yeah. I'll talk to this girl. <clears throat> well, I think yeah. the audio book is good, actually, as a running companion, because you do find yourself in certain parts of the book anyway, you, you'll give yourself these um, cues, prompts to uh, correct yourself and just see are you kind of planting your foot uh, firmly as opposed to on your fore or on your heel? It is a good little uh, prompt. Yeah. Our, our, our listeners, I suppose, are predominantly trail runners. They'll have hydration vests, um, could be full of water, mobile phones, maybe even poles. Uh, some could run with dogs, or I'm asking for a friend actually, they run with GoPros, maybe. Um <laughs> asking for a friend. Uh how sensitive are we all doomed? <laughs> I think you know, we've got to be very careful. It's, it's a good question, actually. I mean, running with things in your hands is a, is a major issue. I mean, even let's say let's say half a liter of water that that, that weighs half a kilo. Yeah. Okay. So you're putting half a kilo of weight on the end of an already very long lever, um, and that can and whilst you're holding something, that arm then goes pretty much. It, 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 it's not moving very much because it needs to stabilize the thing. Yeah, that it must it, send a message to your brain going, "I'm carrying. I'm yeah. out of." movement so that arm really stops moving which means the other one moves a lot more now <laughs> now now well, this is if you remember one thing from from this it's this balance and symmetry in the body beat power any day mm. okay because if this tensegrity model is you and you get beautiful height in your body and load the elastic system now if this was your arms if your arms make the same movement either side with good equilibrium, so every movement is the same odds of movement on the other side. Every movement invests in the next, in the next, in yeah. the next. If one's doing one thing, another's doing another. Actually, all you do is create chaos. 
And yeah. so, and that chaos needs more oxygen and calories mm -hmm. to create, to, to cope with the chaos. Whereas if you get this beautiful height in your body and then balance and symmetry in your movement, elastic recoil brings the move, it helps to bring the body back to its original position. And for, for ultra athletes and for trail runners and for people who are out there for a long time, that's incredibly important because we're all trying to work out how many calories can we get inside of us and how much oxygen can I get in? Well, actually, if we start moving in a way where elastic recoil joins in, because anything with the word elastic doesn't want oxygen or calories. Yeah. It doesn't really lactate. It's, it's as free as you're going to get. So stick something in one arm, and it's normally the left arm because our left, the human's left arm is its stabilizing arm. And so normally if we're going to carry something, it will be in the left arm. Then there is no balance and symmetry anymore. And if that wasn't enough, if you're holding a GoPro or if your friend is holding a GoPro, <laughs> then to hold the GoPro, the hand has got to go into what's called a static isometric contraction to hold it, which yes. means it's all the way up the arm, into the shoulder, into the neck. And there's a lot of tension that's that's the, hard, that's the hardest way to work a muscle is to get, take it into a static isometric contraction wants more oxygen and calories produces more lactate so it, try and carry things on the back yeah, yeah. You know, in, on a pad or, or maybe bottles on the front um but yeah try and keep things out of your hands and if you are if you have got poles and there's an obviously if you're using the poles and you obviously need them in your hands but if you're uh, you come to a stage where you're not going to use the poles, but you're not going to put them away because you think you're going to use them again soon. Do not carry both poles in one hand. Yeah. Again, that arm just stops working and the other one is working very hard. So a pole in each hand, kind of even weight, so you can carry both so that, that they're not, they feel nice and balanced and light. But at least then both arms are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, lots of good stuff there. I wonder, because in the States, it's very super common, isn't it, to carry your hydration in your hand? Uh, <laughs> completely I've i mean never, i'd have never worked out how people do i know people train to do it but mm. i can't do it it just messes with me yeah i went out when when i'd worked with tom evans um and, and, and i'd worked with beth pascal actually and beth was in the race as well i went out to the western states because i was really in, i was coaching in the us and and so i hooked up at the same time and went to the race to watch i wanted to watch both of them race and i was really keen to see jim warmsley as well um and you're right a huge amount of the americans have the bottles and and do yeah. use them uh, but you can just watch them as they're running. You know, one arm really doesn't move anywhere near as much. And that is stealing from you. Um, yeah. They do it. Uh, Either put them in both hands. Well, I, I don't think two, wrong, two wrongs don't make a right because uh. now, now you've got extra weight on this at the end of each lever. So it might even it out a little bit, but it's still compromise. It's still got very heavy. Two static isometric contractions on the hands as well. I've been super grateful of like hydration vest improvement because yeah, oh, that wow. bottle, my goodness, man, that wasn't good. Ready for your quick five. We've used up a lot of time. <clears> yeah, thanks for your time. Oh, okay. These You're are deep, Jane. These are deep, meaningful. Oh. You'll never have been asked some of these questions, I like, can guarantee before, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Go on then, Gaza. You love it. Oh, it's me. amazing. All right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. It's my colour, but I couldn't take that away from you. I know it's your favourite bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be your favourite song, but the last song you remembered listening to. The last song that I remember listening to. Oh, my God. People are so bad at this, Gary. Yeah, I'm, I think it's because I'm, it. I'm actually specifically trying to remember what the last one, what it, what it would have been. I'm embarrassed because it's a Disney. I think this morning as I was driving, I think I'm just trying to think what was happening as I was driving over to the Pivoli. I think it was, I think Black Box Right On Time was on because I was kind of thinking, oh, I think. That's a tune. I'm that's trying, a tune. trying to be right on time, but I was getting it. was a bit <laughs> ironic. I think that's, that's probably that's the one that sticks in my mind. <laughs> Shouldn't be drinking either this time of night, but coffee or tea? Oh, coffee. Any time, coffee. Hey, you're no, looking at these beers. Loads of it. Loads of it. <laughs> Gods. Would you lift heavy or more body weight exercise routine or maybe no lifting at all? As a, as, as, a, as a, is this advice for a runner or is this? Yeah. Well, we weren't sure because we wanted to ask you this as a question, but then we were like, this could go long. So we thought we'd just pop it in here. Well, then. I've read the book. That's why I put it in there. <laughs> no, no, the answer. Yeah. No, no, no weights, no weights. Just, just body weight as you move over the ground. Yeah, no weights, no lifting. <laughs> night owl or early riser? Oh, night owl. Yeah. Definitely night owl. 
Oh, coffee and night owls is all pointing in a <laughs> party direction at Shane's house. Dancing to Right on Time by Black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's a little thought we'd end as a little tribute to Marathon Talk with their um How Fast Could You Run a Mile as a kind of farewell to that great podcast. But you've got seven months to train, your fascia is totally renewed. Um, which ultra is on your bucket list? Which ultra is on my bucket list? Yeah. Oh. Well, I would I would love to do the having been and watched. I'd love to do the Western States. I think that's an amazing. Well, oh, yeah, you could smuggle me in your suitcase, Shane. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> although, although it's a nasty one because it's full of hills, but they're runnable. So you know, something like the UTMB, you might remember well, you don't rest up the hills clearly, but you, yeah. you're not running all the time. But the Western States is is hilly, but but for, for, you know, for the elites, definitely. A runner's course, a runner's course. Western it's oh, red and hot you. and snow as well, isn't it? It's the whole oh, shebang. Oh, well, you know, funnily enough, when the day before the race, I actually ran the first four miles of the course and it, you literally run from burning heat right up into the snow line, the yeah. first four miles. And it's literally almost vertical. I mean, these guys that are running for 100 miles, it's inc absolutely incredible. And actually, Jim Wormsley came past me on the training run. <laughs> and I would have loved to have had a chat with him, but I just couldn't breathe. And he just, <laughs> to breathe. He just bounced past me. And he, you know, like, stop holding that bottle! Yeah, yeah. God, <laughs> God. God. <laughs> Oh, Shane, thank you so much for giving up your time after a super busy day. Um, I'm sure lots of people will have listened to lots and want to know more. Uh, where can people find your book if they are interested in uh, reading? Uh, well, I guess it's available in all good bookstores, as they say. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm sure you can get it off of Amazon. Um, but if you go to the, the, the Running Reborn website, there's links there as well where they can find where to, to get the book and, and all information surrounding that. Is that a dot com or a dot code UK? Sorry, then. Um, dot com sorry and there's an audio book too which is huge because i know lots of people love and it's probably a very good book as well to be able to absorb as you're moving yeah yeah i think the audio book has been uh, you know certainly in australia and in the us and india and canada the, the audio book is huge um yeah. and uh, i actually be interested wrote it as if i was listening to because i listen to audio books all the time so i wrote it as if someone was going to listen to it because I think it, so that was just the kind of the way I was thinking about it. So, yeah, audio is and and um, as you said, you can you can take it out on a run and listen to it. So it's great. It's not like um, some scientific book. It is lots of little anecdotes, stories and your observations and experiences as you've uh, traveled and observed runners. It's, it's, it's a great listen. Yeah, listen. I, I wrote it, so it can't be that clever. It can't. It can't be. That, <laughs> it can't be that technical. So yeah, <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> well, oh, good luck awesome. with everything this year. Hopefully, lots more travel this year and lots more running experiences. Hope maybe for the next book. Who knows? I'm on it. I'm already writing. Oh, I it. knew you would be. I knew you yeah, would. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm on it. So, uh, yeah. right, we'll have you on again then. Book him in, Gary. Another yeah, few. Get a slot in. Get Fantastic. Okay. Well, thanks, Shane. Appreciate Thank it. You, Pleasure. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much, Shane, for coming on the show. Don't know about you, Gary, but when I've been running, I've been trying to make the bow with yeah. my uh, <clears throat> with my pulling up bow forward. That's about as far as I've got. Well, when I was listening to it, when I was like doing the research, listening to the book on my runs, I found myself um, trying to mimic the things that he was um, talking about. Like I think I mentioned in the interview trying to breathe on every three steps um that didn't work well for me uh, i need to work <laughs> i need to work on that one i really thought i was going to hyperventilate so i wanted to kind of <laughs> i don't want to mess with my breathing and kind of like it works i'm a two-stepper two step in two step really? out i'm just like get the oxygen in man let's not let's not overthink it it's too much Anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed that chat with Shane. Go, yeah, have a listen, have a read of his book. Um, go and have a look at some of the work. He's got a really good web page with lots of different videos and all sorts of ideas. This weekend's races, I saw the Montane Trail, the 13th and the 26th, Grisdale Forest over just outside of Keswick, and that is the same bunch of people who do the Lakeland 100 and Lakeland 50, so it's that bunch. I've never done it, the Grisdale uh, Epic. It's cool, what a cool, it's cool, and a good time of year, yeah. a nice little long run hit out. 
Well, I was thinking this time of year, you know, I was I was wondering what the, the winter, what, you know, when they do these winter rounds, what is the UK winter window? Is yes. it end of February? Is that all still classic? Who knows winter? when the winter round, or is it just weather? <laughs> Yeah. I did it in June, but the weather was like winter. So well, yeah, cool. technically, it was a few years ago. We had that beach from the east, which wouldn't have technically been winter, I don't think. But my goodness me, you would have been absolutely battered. You would have tried an FKT that time of year. Another one I've seen, which I've never done also, the Pendle Way in a day. Have you done that one, Eddie? Nope. Nope. Oh, what is this? Best of luck, everybody, doing those two. I have not checked the forecast. Really up and down. You know, we had wind on um saturday then it eased off and then it came again um yesterday eased off again and it's due later on today so we're getting these waves of we're having this proper weather us out up in the alps we've just we had a bit of a snowstorm yesterday uh, but it's very calm okay competition time people have been flooding into facebook with their quick fire questions some hilarious ones you guys will think you're so funny uh <laughs> and some good ones too um we've chosen our winners but we're gonna i mean we're gonna read some of these out because they're so funny but um then we're gonna ruin it because we're also gonna use them in all our interviews so anyway <laughs> you can hear us never mind uh gary do you want to read maybe a couple that you liked and then you and, and i'll read a couple that i like and then we'll read our favorite yeah, yeah, well, great competition, Eddie. Well done for this one. You are 100 percent to take the credit for this. Um, Francesca J J G over on Facebook, Wild We versus Portlo. I mean, why would you like... go in a Portlo apart from I love oh, Wild when Wild. I did my Sante Leon race and I put my hand in the poo on the in the Portlo? <laughs> <laughs> but do you find, I, these days, depends, I, I was over when I'm in the lakes. You can go hours and hours and hours without seeing anybody. You can quite, you know, you take yourself off the trail and do your bits and bobs. That's fine. But when you're on the moors, they're quite busy, the moors. It's, it's a lot. Why do men not take themselves off the trail? I mean, when I'm running up the trail here, especially in winter when it's a bit more busy, men just stand and we, like right on the trail. So, oh I mean, I cannot tell you how many men's willies I see or when I'm running up and I'm like, <laughs> look, I don't drop my steps right there so you come around the corner and get the full frontal like just take a few <laughs> steps off behind the tree it's yeah, embarrassing you run for I, miles and miles and miles a few steps won't make a few steps off the tree so i do not have to like and then i like well i've got to pass you where do i look like do i look directly to like <laughs> acknowledge or <laughs> do i look away like seriously just don't hide yourself away if, yeah. if i find that so and well oh god I'm, I'm raging again <laughs> anyway uh so wild we versus portaloo i think or i would always wild we if i had the op even next to a portaloo <laughs> I just use it like to a, hold on to. I feel like a wild way. Peter Walker, though, go out hard and hang on or start easy and pace yourself. What do you do, Eddie? I think this is an age one. I think this is an age. I think I've, I can't go out hard anymore. I've never done that. <laughs> oh, I used to go out racing so hard. I used to race like as hard as I could for like the first 10 miles and then just hold on. <laughs> now it's like takes me 40 miles just to lightly warm up my knees <laughs> but my winner was Dave Aliano pain of paracetamol that made me chuckle Dave <laughs> I'd like you know what race day I am nowhere near the stuff uh but yeah if it's um just kind of normal running around I think yeah I'm kind of prone to an ibuprofen or Oh, yeah, I do. Um, think about it. I wouldn't take, I only ever take drugs for my migraines, which are self inflicted from epic dehydration, as we talked about. On a race, on a race, I probably would have, unless I, um, but it's not, it can be quite dangerous. So that's the, very dangerous. Yeah. So that's I kind of why. want to embrace the pain on a race, too. I don't really want to mask it because Is paracetamol the same as um, ibuprofen, though, as far as danger. When you're running long distances. Oh, I think the ibuprofen's the the danger. The the danger. Well, neither. I would say don't take either if you're having to take drugs. Maybe I can maybe chuckle that, Dave. So you've got my vote for the competition. A couple that I liked: Hillary, Eddie, or Gary. That's quite rude, Hillary, considering you're my mate. But uh, we both agree. Choose Gary over Eddie. I think most people would They'd be like, <laughs> I, I think we die out with Gary. Uh, <laughs> Russell, I'm going to mention Russell, even though he's had a 
heavy airtime, but it made me laugh. Run a hundred miles with an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bratini <laughs> playing really on your headphones, or uh, run butt naked in Olympic hundred meter final. Which one, Gary? I'm meeting two veggie be swinging around. <laughs> swinging around loose. Imagine. <laughs> yeah, what a sight. Um, oh, That's, wow. I, I think I'd do the 100 metre final. I'm quite, body, um, I'm quite body proud. I think people yeah, kind of. <laughs> nothing here. There's nothing to see. A couple of spaniels' ears and a. 100 metre final. Yes, I do that. But no, I, think, I think I'd be lucky to finish and probably pop a hamstring. I'd be more worried about that than the nakedness. Uh, my favourite was um, Shelley Oyston. If a famous actor was going to pay you in a running film, who would it be? We can't. Oh, come on, Eddie, who would you? Um, oh, I think maybe Cameron Diaz. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you've went straight for the top. Let's aim high. Let's aim high. Let's go. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to return. I want, I want the lips. I want her long legs. <laughs> <laughs> Gary. Oh, what's his name? The guy in EastEnders, landlord. I don't know. I don't even, what, Danny Dyer? <laughs> <laughs> Shane Ritchie? Shane Ritchie. <laughs> Goodness me, I'm just like so not like either of those. <laughs> famous, they're not even famous. I think that's a part of the question, isn't it? Uh, right. Uh, Dave and Shelley, send us a Facebook message or an email, social media, somewhere on social media. Find us. If you don't, we'll find you and you will win a bumper pack of cheer charge goodies and let us know what Tim decides to send you and enjoy munching on those bars. And we yeah. will have another competition very soon. I'm still dreaming about a Terry's uh, Jaffa orange protein bar. I, I checked, I rechecked my stash and there's none in there. <laughs> oh, you're going to have to put in an emergency, uh, emergency shout out. Uh, what we got coming up, Eddie? What have we got coming up? Well, it's a bit of a juggle. It's a bit of a juggle this week with um, not very well children and trying to fit in all my training but the good thing about having a plan is you can just juggle it around i've learned now many years of parenting juggling yeah. it's, it's not trying not to stress what i try and do is do all the little things that i hate doing at home when i'm more home-based like changing bed sheets and i was thinking about that today cleaning shower doors and things like that that i don't want to spend my time doing when i can be outside so i try and do all the little things tick off the little things bit more core work do shorter sessions um, I cut down the warm up, the cool downs, and I just make them count a bit more. So I was meant to be doing five lots of 12 minutes uphill, which requires a good two hours. What I know. <laughs> well, I did that big one. I did um, it's the only way is more uh, last week, and I'm just not going to be able to have two hours um to do that. So I'm just going to go back and do shorter hill, but make them a little bit faster you don't yes yeah. change a bit change be flexible don't stress it's just no point in it mm -hmm. so and then hopefully everyone will be fitting well we've got more ski the boys are in the depth of their ski races now which means they spend all day at the side of a piece and they do two uh two runs basically the whole day yeah. <laughs> Oh. They get all, and it, but it takes up the whole day. They get all nervous, all nervous. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. If they fall, it's all they miss, like the pole, or whatever they're doing. I don't yeah. get it, to be honest, Gary. Um, <laughs> uh, then it's all over. They spent all day, and then they don't even get oh, a result. Wow. It's a, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot for them when they're only little. But brutal. it's all good, all good, all brutal, brutal. This sport. Um, so it's all, it's all about the juggle this week. But we'll make it happen. What about you? Oh, I don't know. Don't tell me. More 200s, 400s. We have got some more 200s and 400s coming up. That's the plan for today, whether I do them or not. Also, I checked the plan six times a mile. Um, yes. That's, I'm not too sure what the rest is on that. I'm still unsure if it's miles or kilometres, but I'm going miles. More is more. Um, so we're going to do that instead. Uh, and, in, you know, again, we talk about this. It's at this threshold pace. So you think, well, at six miles. That's a 10K. And if you even have a, a minute... Request. If I was doing a, a 10k race and someone said you could have a minute jog every mile, I'd go brilliant. That's, that's like perfect. But it's quite intimidating when you see it on paper like that. I had um, I had 10 by four minutes 
threshold pace yeah. and it's not the pace i find it's the volume it's the mental like you start and you've got 10 of them yeah man, that's like it. just holding on i don't find the pace is that the threshold pace is that, but it's the accumulation as well number eight like when you do your mile reps it's gonna number five is gonna feel a lot worse than number yeah. one or number two but that's what our sport is yeah attrition yeah. You got to put it in, but just make it busy. Make it busy, just trying to fit it all in. I'm kind of just stressed out with, you know, getting in at night from work and then working again on the podcast yeah, and YouTube. Podcasts. Yeah, you guys, just wanting it, wanting it every week. Can we have a So just busy, but it's you know we've mentioned this before. It's a choice. Nobody's forcing me to do this. I'm not working in A and E or yeah. anything like that. You're not <laughs> Uh, but I really want to get over to the lakes again, and I don't know if I am. Um, but I, I saw in your coming up that you need a race, and I think I, I'm missing the cross countries because yeah. I'm struggling to do my second key um, speed yeah, session. So much. What about a park run? I uh, yeah, I did think about the park runs. Um, Popping that in often just takes off. You know, you can just go and you have to think about it. Turn up. Yeah, it's all you know. It's it's this kind of dilemma though when you're training for a long endurance event the park run doesn't somehow seem to it's a lot of effort for a 5k when i think i could just do it on my own um i, I don't know yeah you're right 100 right i think a park run would be good how i fit it in i'm not 100 sure oh, pop but... over to the mont pop over to the grisdale go do that no i didn't that <laughs> 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 right if you want to shout out please head over to itunes and leave us a five-star review gary have we got any five-star reviews no we never guess what eddie what, 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 come on guys we're asking you every week get over there and do some work <laughs> yes, come on but even better than a five-star review we Go have on. our first birthday shout out deborah jeffrey's son nathaniel he's two years old on the 21st of february so not only is this your first shout out he could be our youngest listener. Let us know. Fan. Nathaniel, you're two. I wonder, two. I wonder what you get for your birthday. Thomas Tank Engine, Farm and Sam. Probably some. That, that's yeah, no one than Jeffries. There'll be some running. Some very, very active family. <laughs> A new running pram. I've seen them out doing their park on the double buggy, Deborah, pushing the buggy around. But uh, yeah, and uh, from what Deborah was saying, they because Deb was obviously listening to the show. Both of our sons have uh, grown up listening to us too. <laughs> We're wonderful. <laughs> so, thanks for that, Deb. children. That was episode 75. Thanks for listening. Thanks again to Cheer Charge for sponsoring the show. If you are enjoying the show, do like, share, and subscribe. Come on, Gary's getting stressed. He's got so much work to do. Keep him happy. Uh, I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Twaits. And let's run to the hills. Mm -hmm.